right. How's everybody doing this evening? That was good. Can we give our worship team a round of applause? They just do such a good job. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And one more time, can we give all of our first-time guests a round of applause? I've noticed we've got a few first-time guests. Thanks for coming. So glad you're here. My name is Braden. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, Cody Sykes and his wife, they're the campus pastors here at our Midland campus. For those who don't know, my wife and I now live in Lubbock. Uh, we were helping Keith and Natalie Knoll get that campus off and running. Uh, it's going actually pretty incredible. And so it's pretty interesting to see what God's doing. I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, some of you, if you serve or are, are pretty plugged in here, you may already know this, but, uh, or may have got an email this week, but we are actually, uh, I'm kind of nervous, like I don't know exactly what kind of reaction I'm going to get out of this. And we're actually going back to morning services here. And uh, yeah, it was, um, it was kind of a, with fear and trembling that we've made some of the decisions we've made in the last, well, last two years. Uh, I don't guys, if you, I don't know if you know this or not, but there was this thing called COVID that happened and uh, messed up a bunch of our plans and probably some of yours too. So it's had a bunch of us adjusting and scrambling and trying to hear the Lord as to how to move the church forward effectively in a season like this. And uh, when, we, when we actually got ready to, to open this building, uh, that was like one of the conversations that happened is uh, what were our service times going to be? And so we, we talked and, um, you know, we 8.30 and 10, I mean, 9 and 11. And uh, in the middle of that meeting, I just kind of raised my hand. And I was like, look, I'm not saying this is a word from the Lord. I'm just saying this is an idea. Uh, I've always thought, man, if I was just like a regular dude, like I would want to go to church on like a Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Yeah. I get my weekends. I can go fishing. I can go hunting. I can take my family fishing and hunting. And... <laughs> So I just kind of threw the idea out there. I was like, have you guys ever thought about doing evening services? We've got some friends of ours that do, do, do the same thing and even had had some kind of some prophetic swirl around that. Anyway, long story short, we all sat there and we were like, that sounds crazy. Like that really sounds crazy to not have. I think it was Cody at one point said like, so we're going to have Easter evening instead of Easter morning. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm putting it out there. I'm not saying it's a word from the Lord. And we wrestled and we really just couldn't make the decision. And finally, it was Cody who said, well, Guess we're casting lots. And uh, I was like, I have never cast lots. I have a friend, where's Josh? Where's, Josh is a lot caster. He, I think I saw him in here. Yeah, he, he was th he's told me some stories about where he's cast lots on major decisions and how it's worked out. And so I think Cody had that in his mind and he was like, Let, we're, we're casting lots. And so Cody pulls out, this is no joke. That's how spiritual we are. Cody pulls out a coin flip app and he says, all right, pastor, call it. And I'm like, is, it, is, this, is this where we're at right now as a leadership team or is, is this what we're doing? And Cody goes, well, we can't make a decision one way or the other because we were kind of split. We really just didn't know. And so I said, I was, I was fixing to say heads. Uh, heads, we go to, to evening services. And clear as a bell, I just saw an emblem of the tail side of a quarter in my mind's eye. And I was like, ah, oh, I was fixing to say heads, but I just, I feel like I'm supposed to say tails. And he goes, so tails, we go to evening services. I said, well, I guess that's what it is. So Cody flips it, tails, flips it, tails, flips it, tails, <laughs> flips it, tails. And I said, that's enough, that's enough. Out of the mouth of two or three coin flips, let it be established, you know. <laughs> and so, and then there was a few, like I said, there was a few other things. We're like, wow, we really feel like the Lord is really on this. And so, and we thought we had a good reason why. And uh, I think our hearts were pure. Our faith was, I think we were on the right track. And I do believe the Lord was speaking. So we'd go to evening services when we launched. And uh, some of you loved it. Some of you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the evening services. And, uh, and, and some of you didn't. And some of the people that are no longer here didn't. They found a morning service to go to, which is fine. Uh, but we just, we, that we did what we thought the Lord had told us to do. And, and I, I'd love to apologize for it. But if I apologize for that, I'd have to say I'm not going to live by faith the rest of my time as your pastor. And I can't say that. So we're going to continue to do what we think the Lord's leading us to do. Uh, no matter how unconventional uh, the decisions might be. And so anyway, all that led to, and honestly to God, this was nowhere in our plan uh, as far as the Lubbock campus. We didn't do evening services here so that we could do morning services there. We weren't planning to launch Lubbock until September of this year. But as we started having meetings, uh, I mean, we were having 150 people show up to these, these uh, interest meetings. And they were like, they would come once a month just in these interest meetings. And they're like, 
we, you can't just come once a month, like we're ready to go. So uh, we felt the Lord began to speak to us. So we launched the Love at Campus there in, um, in uh, March, March it was. And so uh, we launched early. Well, if we would not have gone to evening services here when we did, we would not have been able to say yes to the Lord then and have our morning services there in Lubbock. And of course, like we had 300 and something people on Easter Sunday already in Lubbock and the church is just thriving already. And it's taken us some time to build up the leadership as you guys know, a lot of us, I preached there this morning, we pre I'll preach here. We've had to do double duty. We've had people driving, staying in hotels and houses and, and pulling this off, but we've developed our leadership teams enough now uh, where we're very confident that each campus can kind of take care of itself. So we'll be going back to Sunday morning services here on August the 1st. There'll be a nine o'clock and an 11 o'clock service, nine and 11. Say it again, say nine, nine. and 11. Nine. Say this out loud, say I will never miss a church service again in my life. I'm uh, just messing with you. So anyway, I, I, I just wanted to be here to make that announcement and let you guys know uh, we're, again, we're, we're moving back to Sunday morning services. We, we felt like the Lord moved and, and spoke to us very clearly. We thought it was for one reason. Turns out it was for another. Um, let me just say this as well. Part of our heart in making this decision, some of the things that came into play was we wanted this to be easier for families. And you know how sometimes something's really good on paper until it happens and you're like, yeah, that didn't go the way I thought that was gonna go. Anybody else make a decision and turn out that way? That's kind of what happened here. We were like, wow, this was not as easy on families as we thought it was gonna be. People who are serving and they're serving, they come to the four, they go to the six, they got kids that are crying and screaming and spitting up demons. And it's just all kinds of weird stuff that you just really don't have time to get into. But uh, anyway, we're just letting you guys know we're going back to Sunday morning services. We hope with all of our heart that you're still with us. I do realize that some of you were able to come simply because it is in the evenings, and, uh, but we get it. We get that uh, life changes, seasons change, and uh, just don't feel any odd feelings. But if you say, man, we, I can't, I work on the evenings or whatever, one, start praying that God changes your schedule. <laughs> and in the meantime, just know that we love you. We support whatever decisions you have to make as, as God's moving your seasons of life around. The church is actually not supposed to be that awkward. Uh, you know, we've all done it. We've all been in seasons where the Lord had us at one church and we go to another church and there's all these awkward emotions and feelings. Uh, and it just tells me, one, that we don't know how to do it quite yet, that we haven't all really come to the unity of the faith uh, where we all understand completely that we're all on the same team at different seasons in our life and nobody's better than anybody else. And so uh, we just honor you as you go if you have to move on to something different that fits your schedule. Uh, if, if you know that that's you, I'd love to say, if I haven't met you before, meet you and just say, and bless you as you go. I know Cody would feel the same way. We just want to bless you no matter what that looks like for you. And so, uh, but we're excited. We're excited. We think it's going to be really good for our families. August 1st, morning services, 9 and 11. Good to go? All right. Well, if you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to speed through, I'm going to speed through some of this. <clears throat> it's interesting preaching at a campus that's so new and then coming here at a little bit more of an established place because it's like <clears throat> one message is supposed to fit like an infant and a teenager at the same time. It's like parenting two different children sometimes, but uh, it, it is very interesting. Before we, before we get to 1 Corinthians 12, let me kind of start with something here. i ask a question real quick. How many of you guys in here have ever seen or heard of the sport, the Winter Olympic sport curling? Okay, most of you in here. Can we just all acknowledge that that is the greatest prank in the history of mankind? That is not a sport. Can we just be honest? Curling is not a sport. And I looked this up, and it's actually been in, it was one, part of the original Olympic, Winter Olympic Committee. It's been there since the very beginning. And it's like, I just imagine these Scottish dudes going to this meeting like, well, we didn't, we didn't get to pick a sport. And one guy jabs the other guy and says, hey, watch this. I'm going to see if this flies. He goes, hey, we, we, we have a sport. Oh, really? What is it called? It's called what is it called? It's curling? What is it? Well, you, you take a, a, a rock and then you slide it to a dot. And then if it's not going the right way, you take a broom and you sweep it really, really fast and you make sure it lands on the dot. And a bunch of guys are like, really? That's a sport? Yeah, yeah. We play it all the time. It gives us Texans hope. Cornhole will be an Olympic sport someday. <laughs> Let's just put that out there. <laughs> Koozies and all. What? <laughs> Can you edit that from the... <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, uh, it's interesting because if you've never seen curling, you, well, most of you have, you got this guy who slides this, this stone and, 
uh, after he slides it, he does the best that he can to get it going in the right direction, but you've got the guys there sweeping and moving things around, trying to make sure it lands where it's supposed to be. So it's constant little adjustments. And I think oftentimes our life as believers, that's what it is. We set something off in a certain direction, but how many guys know it? You don't always get it right the first time, and you're making these constant little adjustments, trying to make sure things are going in the right direction. I remember actually when we, when we started this church, that was, that was what we did. We kind of launched off in a direction. I'm actually kind of curious. How many guys have been with us since the very start of Renew Life Church? Any, any, whew, not very many. Uh, yeah, some of you don't know, won't even know this then, but when we started the church, it was really weird how we started the church. You know, our, my pastor, I just wanted to preach my own sermons. I was happy at the church I was at, and the Lord was moving in my life, and I wanted to preach my own sermons, and I went to go meet with him, ask if I could preach my own notes, and walked away starting our, my own church. And that's literally how it happened in a two-hour meeting, is me just saying yes to him. And so uh, in the middle of all that, since it was really kind of not, I did not see that coming, uh, they kind of encouraged us to go uh, to this place, or, or this training um, group out of Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, and we trained on how to plan a church, how to set things up in the right way, and so on and so forth, and honestly, uh, we're really encouraged by everything that we learned, and we launched the church kind of with an idea of what we wanted the church to look like, so on and so forth, and had a lot of success. It actually was shocking success. We, the church was growing bigger than any church that I'd ever been a part of. Actually, in my own, even as a child, I was never part of a, a church of the size that we were. We were probably four or 500 within the first couple of years. And so um, things were going good, but I just was not satisfied. Something in me was just not satisfied, and I, I just could not figure it out. And one night I was supposed to be preaching this class, and I did not want to be there. I did not want to be there. I did not want to be teaching that class. And I'm, my, my mind's swirling, thinking, if I don't even want to be here to teach the class, why does anybody want to come and listen to me teach the class? And so I had all this internal dialogue going on. And I, I remember sitting at my desk, and I, had, I didn't even have an iPad at the time. I had a three-ring binder, and I was preaching out of like a three-ring binder. And the binder was hanging off the edge of my desk just a little bit. And I was supposed to be looking over my notes, but I wasn't. I was listening to a podcast, studying some other stuff. And uh, I was listening to this pastor and he came across the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. If you've been here very long at all, you've heard me quote this. It says, and God set these gifts in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, healings, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. And when I read this, I, I just got to be really honest with you. I, again, my, my little three ring binder was off the edge of my desk and I just flipped it up in the air like a little two year old fit didn't get some gum at Walmart or something, you know? And, and I just was like, and I flipped that binder up and I went, Lord, we're not even doing this stuff. We're literally not even doing any of this. This is what you said the church is supposed to look like and we're literally not doing any of it. And it was just kind of a little pouty fit I was throwing, but it, it was real to me. It was like, wait a minute, I, I just didn't know that he had laid out so clearly some of the things that he wanted in the church. I'd gone to, you know, class or we are training if you want how to plan a church. Well, they didn't tell me any of this stuff. We didn't talk about apostles or prophets or teaching. We dang sure didn't talk about miracles and healings as the first manifestation God wanted to see in his church. That was not something we were doing. And so I just knew right then and there we had to make a change. It was kind of one of those curling moments where it's like, okay, we need to get the brooms out and get to sweep in the ice. We have got to change the course here. We are not going in the direction that we're supposed to go. And uh, how many of you guys agree the Bible should define what church looks like, not our experience or anybody else for that matter. And so we're moving in that direction. And uh, we began to move in that direction. I remember calling our staff together and just saying, hey, everything we've been doing, we're canceling all of it. <laughs> it was a little bit dramatic. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, a little bit over dramatic. And so, uh, but I said, we, I just can't do this. I have no faith for this. We, I don't even know what it looks like to be a church that goes after miracles, to go after healing. Because we just kind of set that concept of apostle, prophet, teacher off to the side. It was very complex. I had some experience in my own life that made it even more complex and I didn't feel like that was the thing. To be quite honest with you, that was the most broken in what we were doing. It was the fact that we're not even making room for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do and going after that first. And so uh, that's what we did. We started making adjustments and it was crazy to see God begin to move. Miracles started happening. Healing started happening. Uh, it, it was really incredible. I remember one particular Sunday where uh, it was actually Easter Sunday and Leanne was the, the, the tech director at the time and, and she had hired some camera crews to come in and film some B-roll. Because, you know, if you're going to film a service, you want it to be Easter where everybody, you know, hands are lifted, every, room's full, you know. So we, she, this guy comes in to film B-roll for one of our services and at the end of one of our services, 
he was actually kneeling right, I'll never forget this. He was at the, we were at the Cole Theater. He was right there. His name's Ron. And we still stay in touch. And um, he was kneeling down filming me at the very end of service. And I, I just got this very clear word of knowledge. And I said, hey, I, I know it's Easter Sunday and we're fixing to dismiss. And this is not usually when we do this. But I just feel strongly that someone in here has, has a, a, a clicking in your jaw. And when you open them, it's a lot of pain, a lot of clicking. I think it might be TMJ. And the Lord said that he wants to heal you before you leave. And I kid you not, he was filming, and he just kind of pulls the camera down. He's like, he kind of looks, and I, I, of course, it was so obvious, too, because I'm standing right there, and I'm like, is that you? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, we're going to pray for you. I just told everybody, stretch your hands. If you were there, you might remember this. We just stretched our hands out, and we just began to pray. And I said, Lord, just, we just call heaven down in this situation right now. And total restoration, total healing. You didn't bring this up to disappoint. So, Lord, just heal this, this symptom right now in Jesus' name. It's a very simple fair, prayer, very quick. And, Service ends, and I get to the back, and Leanne said, man, that uh, Ron is freaking out. <laughs> and I was like, who's Ron? And she was like, the camera guy that you paid for. And I was like, ah. I kind of felt that was a little risky, you know, when you call out a newbie camera guy in front of everyone. And she said, no, no, he's not freaking out because of that. Um, <clears throat> as soon as you prayed for him, he was instantly healed. <laughs> And he was, he was literally walking around in the back of the, the, the foyer going, I am freaking out. I am freaking out. It's like, that's how we knew he was freaking out, you know. And so he was just so moved by what God had done in his life. And there was things like that that began to happen where the Lord was just confirming, you just say yes. I don't need you to be master healer because you're not. You never will be. I am. I just need you to engage your faith and welcome me into the room and give me space to move. And so uh, we just started seeing some incredible things happen. And uh, you saw some of it happen today. We, it seems like a week, there's not a week that goes by that we don't see a miracle. I saw a, a lady on our staff the other day, was, a migraine was coming on. Her vision was even going out uh, with a migraine. Some ladies were gathered up around her, prayed, never had the migraine again. So we, we see stuff like this. And I hate to... It's just so normal. It's just so normal for us to see those kinds of things. It's normal to see God move. It should be normal to see those kinds of things and see God move. I think we knew we'd have to come back and address this other thing, this apostle prophet teacher. And I want to take just a minute to talk to you about some of this uh, and introduce this concept. I've talked around this at times here before, um, but what does it mean? What it, first of all, what is an apostle and what does it mean to be apostolic? Uh, if you're like me, you come up in an environment. How many of you guys have ever heard any teaching on apostle or apostolic ministry? How many? Yeah, not very ministry. It's not something that most people kind of go at. It's kind of one of those things where like, I have a few of these things in scripture where you, you read something, you're like, I literally have no idea what that is. You just move on, right? Well, that, that can be okay at times, but when something's in scripture, it demands our attention. We don't actually get permission to say, you know what, I don't understand that. That doesn't seem like that's for me. And we just move on about our life. It's like, no, no, wait a minute. If the, if, and we're going to read later, the foundation of the church was built on apostles and prophets. Or the, the foundation of the church is apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And the rest of the church is built on top of that. It, it's like anything else. Tongues, healing, manifestations of the spirit, tithing. Just because you don't understand it, just because it doesn't feel right at first, doesn't give you permission to say, well, that's just not me. No, it's not you yet. Do you hear me? It's not you yet. It should stir up hunger in you to say, okay, Lord, apparently there's more. If I don't understand it, that's okay. I don't want to feel guilt and shame about that, but apparently there's more. And the scripture actually says for, the, for all of eternity, we will constantly be exploring and learning more about who God is and his goodness and his love. And so uh, I, I knew we'd have to come back to this. Not pe many people touch this subject. The word apostle actually means sent one. In its simplest form, the word apostle means sent one. Uh, Jesus was actually walking the earth. He was the one that chose to use this word apostle. He was, he was living and walking the earth during a, a, a Roman ruled uh, time and the Romans actually stole this term from the Greeks. The Greeks actually had this word, it was a military term. And the Romans stole this term because Rome would go and conquer parts of the world. They would conquer it, but when they would come back to it years later, months later, whatever, that new region that was Roman, a Roman ruled region didn't look like Rome. So they were conquering it, but they were not culturalizing it. 
And so they, they embraced this term, Roman apostles. They were military officers, and they said, okay, you're going to be the apostles of Rome, which means you're going to come with the authority of Rome, have the authority of Rome, but your job is to culturalize the area. We're sending you into this region. We're going to send you over here with Rome behind you, and your job is to bring the culture of Rome to this area where no matter what Roman uh, region you were in, everything looked the same. The, 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 we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's actually not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. It's the, it's, the, it's the prayer the Lord taught the disciples how to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's an apostolic prayer. That's him telling us, I'm sending you into the world. I'm not, not to wait until you get to go to heaven, but so you can bring heaven to the world. Yeah. So it's a very apostolic concept there. But uh, I want to talk for just a minute, and again, I'm kind of speeding through this, of what does it mean what, are, what is an apostle? Apostles are sent, but what does it mean to be apostolic? First of all, what you have to understand is when the Lord does something, oftentimes what he'll do is he, he works through the concepts of seed time and harvest. Those are the same concepts he has us work by, but he himself works by those. In fact, take the Garden of Eden, for instance. He didn't just fill the entire earth with everything that he wanted. No, he seeded a garden. Then he gave the responsibility to Adam and Eve and said, hey, take what I've started, this seed, and you expand the borders. He works, the Bible says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will never cease. If you go and study uh, biblical leadership, uh, when, 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 we're, when, when Paul is teaching the church there uh, on how to select biblical leaders, here's one of the things he says in 1 Timothy, actually. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, skillful in teaching, not overindulging in wine, not a bully, but gentle, not contentious, free from the love of money. Now, now notice this. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, excuse me, how will he take care of the church of God? So the Lord says that someone who's called to be a leader in the church is not just someone with a lot of charisma or a lot of gifting, it's actually someone with a lot of character. I think the church would be a lot further along if we had been picking people based on their character or maybe just to say it this way, according to the scripture, instead of according to their pizzazz, their humor, their, their, their charisma, their gift. I think that's one of the things we're seeing right now in even the American church. We're seeing leaders fall because they were propped up on their gift, not their character. And so people being propped up on their gift instead of their character get up into a place in leadership, then they fall, and guess what, what happens? There's collateral damage in the church. And all of a sudden, the church, people in the church say, oh, I got wounded, I'm never going to church again, I'm never gonna do this again, and believe it. Why? Because God disappointed them? No, God, God didn't disappoint them. A church leader disappointed them. And doing church the wrong way is what set that person in a place where he could disappoint someone anyway. Are you hearing where I'm going? So why is church leadership so important, or leadership in the home so important for a church leader? Let's look at Ephesians 2, 19. It says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. God calls his people, God calls his church a household, not just a gathering and not a business, but a home. So he says, here's what we're going to need in the church, people that are already good in the home. You find me someone that's good in the home, we seed that person in leadership into the church, all of a sudden the church will start looking like the family that I've called it to look like. Why? Because he's already proven that he's good in the home, he'll be great in the church because the church is a spiritual home. He's always done this. Same thing goes for apostles and apostolic leadership. God, if, if you've maybe ever been taught wrong as it pertains to apostles, hear me on this. God has no intention of raising up a man to be glorified just because he carries the title apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or anything else for that matter. This, this concept of apostle is not so some man can get glory, and it's dang sure not so there can be some spiritual hierarchy where the apostle sits at the top of the pyramid and looks down at all his little minions, and they exist to serve his vision. It's wrong teaching around this area that has made some people hear the word apostle and go, you know what, I've been around that crazy bunch of blah, 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 because it's just been done the wrong way. 
says this in the book of Ephesians. It says now, uh, we already read this. It says, now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on, having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. You ever walked into someone's house and just went, man, you have the sweetest foundation. Man, this foundation is just incredible. No. So it's actually not the found, the foundation is not even the thing that's the most seen. And true apostolic and prophetic leaders, they have no desire to be the seen ones. They have the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to be, I'm going to start at the bottom and push other people above me. Where's the rest of the house? Above the foundation. It's the apostolic and prophetic heart to help people get further than they've ever been in their life. To give away for free what costs them everything. It's called spiritual inheritance. The Bible says that a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. What is, he, what is he saying? Kingdom thinking is pushing other people above you. It's natural. It's innate inside apostolic, true apostolic and prophetic leaders to say, no, no, I'm not going to build something for me. I'm going to build something that makes people bigger than me. So he takes that, that thing that's natural in an apostle and he seeds that into the body of Christ. Why? Because he wants all of us, just like he did with church leadership. He wants every single one of us carrying the heartbeat. The church does not exist for me. Ministry does not exist for me. It is the heart of the Father. It is the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to be the foundation and to push others above me. That is actually what real apostolic leadership looks like. I want to read you a, a story where I, I feel like Jesus came across someone who by revelation had an understanding of what apostolic government really looked like. You've heard this story before. It starts in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5. It says that when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man. Now pay attention to this. He said, I also. Say, I also. I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my slave, do this. And, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this. When Jesus heard this, it says he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have, not, I have not seen this type of faith, no, not in all of Israel. What is this faith? What is this understanding that this centurion had that wowed Jesus? Have you ever just thought, I'd love to do something someday that Jesus marveled at? Yeah. <laughs> this, Jesus hears this centurion and, Je and he says, look, just, just send the word. Yeah. He says, because I also, in other words, just like you, so this is Centurion saying this to Jesus. Just like you, I'm a man under authority with authority. Under authority, which one comes first? Under authority with authority. That is the nature of apostolic people. That word apostle, remember, it means sent one. You cannot be sent unless you are under authority. That word implies that. If I were to say, hey, Neil, stand up right now. You know why Neil stood up? Because I have a microphone. No, you can sit down too. But when I say to Neil, hey, Neil, would you stand up right, right quick? And if I were to say, hey, Neil, I want, you to, I want you to go to that side of the room. And I say, I'm sending you to the other side of the room. If Neil just got up and started walking, it would represent that I have authority in his life. It would also represent that Neil is submitted in at, at least that degree. He can at least be told to walk across the room. When, when, when some, the, the word apostle by nature means I am someone who I may have authority, but I only have authority because I'm under authority. I have been sent. I want to bring to you two very, very simple points. Very, very simple points, but I, don't, I think they cannot be overlooked. Apostolic people are submitted people. Apostolic people are submitted people. They are people who are under authority under the authority of what first and foremost they are under the authority of the word of God scripture 
is the ultimate authority in their life. No matter what they feel, no matter what they think, we are living in a day and an age where our culture hates to be told what to do. It hates anything that's black and white. We have a culture that's saying, you can't tell me that there's just men and women. Well, actually, I didn't tell you that there were men and women. The Bible says, the scripture says, he created them male and female. And then he put this interesting little thing called a period, which means there are no more. Right? (laughs) This is not me being ugly. This is me helping you understand something. We have a culture that, you know, the interesting thing about scripture, it's very black and white. Very, very black and white. Not a lot of gray. So there's some gray. Actually, there's a lot of gray, but it's, 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 it's pretty black and white. There are a lot of things that are very clear-cut lines. Male and female. Period. Mm, let me see how much trouble I want to get in tonight. Um, what we're talking about being the church that God had in mind. And God put apostles first in the church. Why? To seed this idea of sent ones. Apostles and apostolic people are submitted people. We're submitted to scripture, which means I may have an opinion about how something should be done, but I'm gonna first check with scripture. And if scripture doesn't align with how I feel, I'm gonna bend to scripture, not ask scripture to bend to me. One of the areas that, I, and I get on my soapbox about this and all the time, but I, until I start to see some fruit, I'm going to stay on the soapbox on this one. But I'm, I want to talk to parents for just a minute. You are doing your kids no good. Hang on, you know, you, you, you. I want, I want everybody in here just to say this out loud. I love my pastor and he loves me. And no matter what he says next, he's just trying to help me. Okay, back to what I was saying. (laughs) You're doing your kids no good, no good, especially as it pertains to moving them towards their assignment of being apostolic people, apostolic big people who are under authority with authority. If when they are little bitty people, you tell them to do something and they don't do it, and then you just either distract them or ask them to do something different. Hey, you go pitch your toys up right now. I don't want to put my toys up. Well, then just go straight to bed. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't go straight to bed. You get your little butt in here and you pick up your toys like I told you to. And if you don't, and now listen, I'm not being ugly. I, I, I'm telling you how I treat my kids. I love my kids. If you see around my, you know my kids love me. I'm telling you, say, no, no, no. You go in there and you pick up that toy like I told you. And if you don't do it this time, I'm going to bust your little bobo. Y'all know what a busting is? We got some California people here and don't know what a bobo or, or busting is, you know? I'm messing around. No, no, why? What, what are you saying? I am the authority in your life. And even though you don't feel like picking up your toys, you just want to go straight to bed. How you feel is not the truth. There is only one truth on this planet, and it is the truth. There is no such thing as your truth. I don't care what anybody tells you. It is, your truth does not exist. There is the truth. So what I'm teaching my kid is there is one truth and there is one God. And in this home, it is me. That's the truth. That's biblical. In the home, the parents represent God to the children. So you are training them. God is saying, your, your father is saying, go pick up your toy. When you say, I don't want to pick up my toy. I go, no, no, you're going to do that or you're going to get a spanking. And follow through. They don't, no, I'm not picking up. Okay, you're going to get a spanking. What are you saying? When you resist authority, Pain comes. Pain comes. And, it, you, and you keep increase. You can start with discomfort. Again, we're not here, talking here about abusing kids. But read your Bible. There's this thing called the rod of correction. It still is working today. So what I'm saying is, is you, you bring discomfort. If discomfort don't work, you bring pain. If a little bit of pain don't work, you bring a little bit more pain. Not to abuse. I'm not talking about hurting your kids. But here's what I'm saying. You're teaching them that outside of authority is pain. Inside authority is comfort. Now, why would we want them? What would, if we don't do that when they're little, what does this thing look like when it grows up? 
It's a 16-year-old who's been taught in driver's ed, when you see a yellow light, slow down. But they think, no, no, I'm not slowing down. I'm going to gun it. And that goes for most of the rest of us men in here. <laughs> so here's an authority, the laws, the rules that say, no, 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 you don't have to slow down. I, I know more than the yellow light knows. So I'm going to gun it. And what happens? Time after time, you may get away with it. You may get away with it until one time you don't get away with it. And someone hits you. And what happens? It's a pain that's way worse than a bobo spanking. But it's not understanding and it's not building a lifestyle that I do not exist outside of laws and boundaries and rules. I am safe when I'm inside boundaries, laws, and rules. It starts in the home. And it's apostolic. Apostolic people live under authority. They do, there is not a scripture in that book that they are not submitted to. There's a bunch of them in there I don't like. There's a bunch of them in there you don't like. We've all gone through this one. Sex is amazing. You can laugh. It, 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 sex is amazing. And, and I, when you were a kid and you saw someone, you're like, I want to have sex with that. <laughs> no, I mean, I really want to have sex with that. And I don't see any good reason why I should not be able to have sex with that. Everything inside of you is going, I belong with that. <laughs> And that belongs to me. And there's no way that one little night of having a little fun, we're just kids, there's no way that that can really violate, oh, I'm not going to get married someday. My marriage is not going to be the same someday. And we'll sit there and every feeling on the inside of us is saying, do not submit to the authority of Scripture that says, don't have sex before you're married. Oh, you know, I've, I've, but I've been married. And I'm actually on my, my third marriage, and, you know, we're living together. It's, it's, not, it's different now, you know, because I've already kind of been there, done that. You know, it's funny. I didn't get that same scripture. I didn't find that same scripture that you apparently found. <laughs> what are we saying? I live under authority. I'm submitted to the scripture regardless of what it says. Thank you, Cody. You, you, you can clean this mess up after I leave. I, I've got a cruise because I'm already past my time. Um, submitted to Scripture, submitted to the Holy Spirit. Can I just say this? When I, when, as it pertains to being submitted to the Holy Spirit, we have to learn to let the, just the smallest amount of nudging cause us to move. The smallest amount of nudging, the Holy Spirit saying, go pray for that person. Go give that person $100. Start, start doubling your tithe to the local church. Uh, that person over there, would you go see if they know G who Jesus, the, oh, your mother-in-law that you've been praying for, this is the trip that you're going to actually go ask her, does she, is Jesus her personal Lord and Savior? Those little nudges. It's a funny thing. We, w one of the things we do to get out of our own fear is we say, you know, I'm just not really sure if that was the Lord or not. I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to continue to meditate on that. Yeah, because the devil's telling you to lead your family member to the Lord. The devil's telling you to give money away. And be generous and be kind. Come on. No, no. It, it, it's, it takes some time to learn to be really responsive to even the smallest amount of leading. My first job when I was 12 was breaking horses. And when you first break a horse, you don't put that little leather strap bit, a bit with the leather strap on. No, no, they'll snap that thing this quick. You put what's called a hackamore on. And the hackamore has got two big old cotton ropes. Because at first when you're breaking a horse, a horse wants to fight you. And if a horse wants to say, you're not, I'm not going where you tell me to go. So you literally have to have something that's so thick and strong that you can literally force their head around. Well, after a while, the horse begins to trust the rider. They say, wait a minute. I don't have to keep letting him jerk on my head. If I'll just start to move as soon as he gives me any sign that he wants to go somewhere, my life is way easier. And he stops spurring me. <laughs> then eventually, all of a sudden, when that horse starts to what they call give you his head, Give, let you have, let him take you where he wants. Then you can put these little, these little leather straps are about that wide, little thin, and the horse can snap that thing with no problem whatsoever. But then you can completely control that horse, and it's a horse that's what they called rain trained, meaning the slightest amount of pressure, and that horse does exactly what you want. If you've ever watched a really good rain trained horse in, in like a raining class or something like that, it is incredible to watch. They don't even have to move their hands really anymore. They just shift the weight of their body, and these horses are just responding. You know why? Because they've learned, you know what? My life's a lot better when I just respond to a little bit of pressure. Did you know as it pertains to the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to be rain trained? God doesn't want to jerk your head around and make you do this or that or the other. No, we're supposed to be doing that when, the, when our kids are little. And say, no, no, you're, you're going to go this way. But here's, guess what? If we don't do a good job when they're little, they grow up and they're like, man, 
they're, 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 they're causing problems. And the Lord doesn't want to lead us that way either. He wants to lead us with that still, small voice. He wants to be rain trained. We're supposed to be submitted to the Holy Spirit in that way. And we're also supposed to be submitted to the spiritual family. I'll just close here. I didn't get to finish everything, and I'll, I'll pick this back up sometime. But the last thing we're supposed to be submitted to is we're supposed to be submitted to spiritual family. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21 says, Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Did you know that one of the most humble things that you can do is submit to another person like you? We all agree, I should submit to Scripture. I should do what the Bible says. We all agree in principle, we should do what the Holy Spirit says. But do what another human being tells me to do? That can be difficult. That's why he put this scripture here, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? It means I'm gonna submit to you because I believe the Lord's put just as much of you in him or her as he did me. And I don't know everything. And in fear of the Lord, I'm gonna live a humble life, always assuming that somebody else also hears from God. Somebody else also knows some, some things. And I'm going to choose to subject my life to the counsel of my spiritual family. One question you need to ask yourself, and this is a very simple way you'll know, am I actually truly submitted to spiritual family? When's the last time in your personal life a situation has come up You've asked somebody else, hey, what do you think I should do in this situation? They told you to do something that you didn't agree with or didn't want to do, but you did it anyway. If you can't remember the last time or if you've ever done that, then you are actually really not submitted to spiritual family. We need moms and dads in our lives that we go to and say, hey, I, just help me here. We need moms and dads in our lives that we've given them permission to say, hey, I want you to know if you ever see something in my life, I need you to speak into that. We need brothers and sisters who are challenging us, sharpening us, just like iron sharpening iron, one friend sharpening another. Guess what sharpening requires? Friction. Friction. We should be inviting friction into our life. Why? Because we want to become who God's called us to become. And I'll just end with this. Apostolic people are submitted people, and submitted people are powerful people. The Lord does not trust someone with power who has not already given them control over his life over their life. You want more power in your life? You want to see more of your prayers answered? You want to see people getting healed? You want to see God using you in incredible, incredible ways? Say, so you know what, Lord, I want more power, so I'm going to get more submitted. More submitted to Scripture. More submitted to the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. More submitted to spiritual family in my life. Why? Because the more submitted I am, the more power you make available to me. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you need prayer or have never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, we would love for you to reach out to us. Check out our website at RenewLifeChurch.com for all of our contact info. Also, if you're interested in financially supporting what God is doing at Renew Life, you can give via our website with text to give or by mailing a check to our office. God bless you and we hope to see you soon.